So we are now in chapter six. We're a little bit halfway through um, the book. Uh, so this chapter is about going away. I was in beauty school in Florida and my mom picks me up and takes me back to Alabama and takes me to the doctor. The next recollection I have is being dumped at the Salvation Army home for unwed mothers in Birmingham. It was an old, old, old house with big rooms. I was put in a situation in which I had no control. It was almost like being put on a train or like being in a car wreck or something. Once you start skidding, that's it. I kind of skidded through it. Anytime they approached the subject of the baby, it was when you give up the baby or after you leave here. They were telling me that I could just forget all about this, go home and pick up my life where I left off. Joyce won. The maternity homes that many women were sent to in the 1950s and 1960s were modern incarnations of homes run by organizations that had been doing quote-unquote rescue work with women's and girls since the late 1800s. Two of these organizations, the Salvation Army and the Florence Crittenton Mission, had initially defined their work more broadly as offering shelter and redemption to all sorts of fallen women, including prostitutes, the homeless, and unwed mothers. During the first two decades of the 20th century, the Christian women who ran the homes gradually narrowed their focus to residential facilities for unwed mothers. In part, this was due to their lack of success with prostitutes. By turning their attention to quote-unquote first offenders, they hoped to find women who were more amendable to redemption and to intervene in their lives before they turned to prostitution for survival. Maternity homes continued to proliferate proliferate, and in the years when the women I interviewed were sent away, there were more than 200 maternity homes in 44 states run by the Florence Crentantine Association of America, the Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, and others. Despite the sizable number of facilities by the 1960s, they could not accommodate the growing number of single pregnant girls who needed a place to live out their pregnancies. A young woman who could not go into hiding as soon as she began showing often hid her pregnancy by wearing one of the massive spandex girdles that were popular at the time. Even among girls who needed them only to hold up their nylon hose, these girdles were invaluable in helping a girl preserve her reputation. Since it was often impossible to enter a maternity home until the seventh month of pregnancy, collectively the homes could house only about 25,000 girls a year, and as many as 35% of the applicants were turned away. Frequently, a young woman destined for a maternity home was sent to a quote-unquote wage home until the space in the maternity home became available. Families in the, these homes took girls in and provided them with room and board, and occasionally a little spending money in exchange for housekeeping and ironically child care. This arrangement allowed a young woman to leave her family's home and community while she waited to enter the maternity home. It also meant she could earn her keep during the weeks or months she stayed with the family, and thus the total cost of her exile was considerably lower than if she had stayed at a maternity home the entire time. A priest and family friend came out to the house, and an arrangement was made where I was going to be whisked away. Nobody would know where I was. It was arranged through Catholic Charities. I would be living with a family. He would be my gynecologist and take care of the delivery of the baby, and in return, I would be the nanny, help the kids with their schoolwork, and do the laundry. I was given a room in the basement. While I was living there, everybody was told that I was living in Florida. The priest had a cousin who lived in Pompano Beach, and I could write out postcards. I'm having a wonderful time. I'm doing this and that, and he would mail them in an envelope to his cousin, and they would be postmarked from Florida. So any correspondence I had was very controlled. My mother would come to see me on Saturdays and reminded me that I shouldn't eat too much because I would put on weight. I was given a sun lamp to make sure that when this was all over, I looked like I spent time in Florida. Kathy. They found what they call a wage home for me right away. 
I went and lived with a family that had eight children. You were sent, you were their servant. I went to their Catholic infant home in St. Paul, one or two days a week for school until I graduated. Other than that, I did laundry, cooked meals, and took care of eight little kids. They had many pregnant girls stay at their home. Mary won. I was sent off to be a nanny for a family. The man was a physician and they had three children, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn baby. I was the nanny and did light housekeeping. They gave me a nice room in the basement and they liked me because I was their girl. It was the in thing in their neighborhood to have a girl. Word got around that we were virtually free help, Cheryl. Middle-class girls who did not go to a maternity home were often confined to the family's home where their mothers could keep a watchful eye on the doc on the door and send them running to their room if anyone came knocking many older women including college students and those working full-time simply continued to live on their own while others went to live with relatives in distant towns some worked directly with adoption agencies and never spent time in a maternity home or told their parents they were pregnant. Sometimes the women's parents never learned that a grandchild had been born until long after the event, if ever. Um, so that actually happened with my mom. Now, granted, this was in the 1990s, so making that aware, she didn't live at home. Um, she was a grown adult. You know, these unwed homes for mothers, um, they still exist in 2023, but they weren't as prevalent they're still not as prevalent um anyway she didn't even tell my grandparents that she was pregnant because she was already seen as a black sheep due to her religion and um, her having left the Mennonites so there's still like we talk about issues with that but um yeah I mean sometimes they don't know and sometimes even birth fathers don't know and they wish they could have raised the baby um, but again, there's still a lot less stigma, um, a lot less, um, what's the word, um, social pressure on a bio father than there is on the bio mother in these situations. So anyway, I was working in Washington, D.C. at the time for the telephone company. I went to talk to someone at social services and she made arrangements for me to go to a Florence Christian home in my seventh month, all while I'm going to work and getting bigger and bigger. So everybody at the telephone company knew my situation. In fact, I was in D.C. when Martin Luther King got shot, when the rioting started and we couldn't leave our building. There was one bed in the whole building and they were kind enough to let me sleep in it because I was six months pregnant. It was kind of eerie, you know, because troops were marching up and down the street. The National Guard was out and there were fires everywhere. We didn't know what was going to happen. A month later, I was in the Florentine Crintentine, Florence Crintentine home and during the time, we were watching the presidential primaries in California and we saw Robert Kennedy get shot. So it was a traumatic time. My world was in turmoil, but it was the rest of the world. It kind of put my problems in perspective. I started focusing on the people around me and helped me that helped me to cope. I try to help others who seem to be emotionally distraught and it had a calming effect on me, Nellie. All I knew was that I had to somehow disappear. I didn't tell my parents. I just wrote and said I was going off and to find a job not to worry. My baby's father drove me to Cleveland and left me with some money that paid a little toward the Florence Crententine home. I was there from June through the birth of my baby, which was November 22nd, a date you can't forget because four years later, on the same date in 1963, John Kennedy was assassinated. So it makes the date even more melancholy, melancholy because something very tragic in American history occurred on that same day. Carol won. The financial cost to a young woman or her fi or her family for the maternity home, the hospital, and the doctor's care was not insignificant. In 1951, the cost of a Salvation Army home was $50 per month, plus a $50 delivery charge. By the early 1960s, the cost of room and board alone 
could run over $100 per month, with the average stay at of just over six weeks and additional delivery charges. The total cost could easily exceed $200 or what today would be equivalent to $1,200. Some maternity homes use a sliding scale and charged according to the parent's income. A few women reported paying nothing at all, though in some cases those who could not pay were admitted to homes contingent upon the surrender of the baby. Occasionally, the young man's family offered to pay part of the maternity home expenses, but among the women I interviewed, it was more common for the families of the young women to pay. Some families required their daughters to pay them back. Several women talked about the payments they continued to make to the home or to the payments long after their stay. After I came home from St. Mary's and got back on my feet, my mother told me straight out that I owed her for the money I would have contributed to the household during income during the, the months that I didn't work. She actually wrote it out. She gave me a piece of paper that showed how many weeks. At half the pay that I would have gotten during the time. She said when I got a job, I was going to have to pay her back. I even owed her for the months before I went into the maternity home because I had to quit work, obviously. See, back then you didn't work when you were pregnant. Plus, I owed Catholic Charities for the lay at the christening outfit and the postnatal care. I remember it was a huge sum of money. I couldn't believe how much I owed everybody. I did get a job and I paid my mother back. It took a year and a half and after that I started paying back Catholic Charities. Long after my daughter was adopted, I went in to make my final payment. Recently I got my file from Catholic Charities and it was quite detailed about the whole sequence from the time I met with them through my stay at St. Mary's and then every month after until I paid off the final debt. But I just broke down and I cried when I saw the last paragraph of all this documentation. The last entry about me and the baby. It said I had finally come in to pay the balance and I still had a chip on my shoulder. Sheila. So often times a lot of people think that birth mothers are paid to adopt their baby out, right? Um, And that's not true. If agencies, and this is in more recent years, you know, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, where if an agency gives money, it's very, very little, right? Birth mothers do not actually make an income off of their child. In fact, they don't, they not only pay a financial price, but they pay an emotional and a mental one as well. So, it's so, it's so tragic, but also it's f- coerced adoption. That's illegal, but they don't care. They just, they don't. Anyway, continuing on. The experience of living in the maternity home varied greatly among the women I interviewed, but almost all talked about feeling afraid and abandoned when they were told they would be sent away. Many had never been away from home and almost were not and most were not given any information about what they would find before they arrived. It is doubtful that the parents had much information to offer since most of them did not visit the homes in advance. I was so scared. I wanted so badly for my parents to say, You're staying with us, you're our girl. I had this persona of a hippie, but I just wanted to be with my family. We drove to the maternity home in Biddeford, Maine. On back roads. Okay, I love Biddeford, Maine. Just saying, it's a beautiful place. Um, Sad that she had to be there because of this, but um, man, such a beautiful area. Anyway, continuing on. My mother and father were so heartbroken. I was told on the way I was supposed to be in an old orchard beach working in a motel as a chambermaid. All right, sorry, I'm getting off track. I am so distracted by this main thing. Um, I grew up, and I still go every year to Maine, right into this area. Um, So I know exactly the area she's talking about. And it's it's very much um, white-collar, white mostly white, I say, 
um, middle class to upper class families visiting. It's very much a vacation area. Um, and it's beautiful, by the way, very gorgeous. Um, but still, it's it's very sad that we're talking about this in the, you know, late six, you know, late fifties, early sixties, that she had to go through this. Anyway, so while I was at the home, I got t- to get a tan to continue the cover up. I walked in, and there were all these strange pregnant people and these nuns, and some of the nuns were harsh, harsh. I had committed a sin. It's not like today when you go through therapy, for God's sakes. No, there was no therapy. When my parents turned around and walked out that door, I felt abandoned. I felt so alone, and I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how parents could do that. Lynn. I was sent away to Florence Crentantine House. I remember going up a long drive to this gothic castle-like building with big trees and a winding drive. It was big, thick doors and when I entered I saw two girls coming down the stairway and they just looked so sad we had a little lounge on each floor and in the lounge we had a little tv and what they called hi-fi back then this was in the days before stereo they had we had two records one was Charles Ray born to lose and the other was something about stuck up here I want to go home I mean real upbeat songs Most of the girls didn't stay there as long as I did, but it always felt full. It was just a revolving door, Polly. Life at the maternity home generally included chores like washing dishes, helping in the kitchen, or cleaning toilets. Often tutors supplied by local districts, local school districts, to continue their education and avoid being held back. Recreational activities included instruction in pursuits that were appropriate for young women headed for a life of domestic such as sewing, knitting, or classes in arts and crafts. Girls were usually asked to take an, on an assumed name, first name, when they entered the maternity home, and then they used their fake name with the other girls. This renaming meant to protect young women's identities. It could not have been very effective since the young women could obviously recognize each other. Perhaps it was meant to separate the young woman's pregnant identity from the identity she would assume when she left the home. Um, So speaking of which, um, I'm not sure if this book is going to go into it, but with adoptees birth records, um, our parents on the birth certificate get changed from our adoptive parents to our... um, adoptive parents, right? And I'm assuming that they use their real biological names if they can. But a lot of the times, most of the time, the adoptee has their name changed from what the bio parent would name them to what the adoptive parents name them. No, you know, and it I'm not going to say it matters on the age. It it does, but it doesn't because they're in charge, right? So I will say it's probably less likely if they're older, like a teenager, unless they have permission. Um, But it's more common with the babies. Anyway, I was a sophomore in college at Wheaton and I was walking across campus and it was late at night in the fall. The street lamps were all lit and this girl was coming toward me and just under the light, we saw each other's face. We both stopped in our tracks. It was a girl who had been at the home with me. That home was very confidential, and nobody could say the other person's last name. But there she was. We hugged and we stood there under the lamp chattering away, but in hushed tones. We didn't want anybody to know we'd both given up our children. Nobody in our families except our mothers knew except their mothers. Rose. Despite the rules behind closed doors, many of the girls divulged their real names, talked about their boyfriends and families, and speculated about giving birth. what giving birth would be like. Some homes organized outings or allowed the girls to walk freely in the neighborhood. Occasionally, the girls were required to put on wedding bands when they left the building. Since they often traveled in groups, it is doubtful that the trade was very effective. The homes were sometimes quite strict when it came to communication with the outside world. The women were permitted visits from their parents, though some families did not visit, call, or write their daughters the entire time they were there. In some cases, letters in and out were read and censored, and phone calls could 
be made only to inv- individuals who were on an approved list. If there was a list, it usually did not include the father of the baby. The lack of communication generally ensured that there would be no opportunity to work out a resolution that included the young man if the girl had held out hope of doing what of doing so when she entered. I was not allowed to call the father of my child. Even when we would write letters, they would read them. They would either cut out things they didn't like in them, or they would cross through what they didn't like. If the letter really upset them, they would throw it away in front of us or tear it up. That goes for anything coming in or anything going out. They read everything. They censored everything. They were not allowed to call the father of the baby. You were not allowed to call friends. You were only allowed to call your parents or anybody else who was on the approved list. Karen, one. My parents are both dead now, and I actually found the letters I wrote them while I was away. They were hard to read because I was still so naive and such a goody-goody. I was trying to protect them, trying to give them this picture of a normal life. With my continual Shirley Temple kind of, I'm having a great day. The baby is kicking. Everything is wonderful like it was a normal thing. I'm going to ceramics class. I'm working on a very nice plate. I mean, I was living in an institution for Christ's sake. They locked us in at night. It wasn't a normal life at all. Deborah. Some women did not have, did not see the maternity home as a negative experience. They were relieved to be out of, from under the scrutiny of their parents and the community. A few recalled having helpful counseling sessions that enabled them to come to terms with their experience they were going through. I was sent to Buffalo to see to live with my aunt and uncle and then went into a maternity home the last six weeks. Many of the girls came from other parts of the country, so nobody would know that they were there. They just came and went in the night. They appeared and then they left, and you never heard from them or had any contact afterward. But they had some excellent social workers who were really, who really, really cared about us. From what I understand, if after you give up a child your physical and your mental psyche just had just wants to get pregnant again they worked very very hard to make sure that did not happen they were very concerned and spoke about our emotions afterward and how to handle it jill okay pausing there i'm really curious as to what they said um you know i cannot speak from the birth mother perspective Um, I am a mother, but I am not a birth mother, right? In the sense that I did not give up my child for adoption. So I don't know about that. Um, I can tell you that emotions absolutely do change, um, not just for the adoptee, but for birth birth moms as well. However, what she's talking about, um, I kind of want to say that it was diluted. You know, again, this book was written, you know, in the early 1990s so I don't know how much Jill has come to terms and how much therapy she has I can't speak to that what I can say is that statistically speaking most birth moms don't actually end up having another child they don't because of that significant loss in the family um or at least it takes them a long time to come to copes with um so you know I I don't know if what she's saying is true in the sense that that's what they're telling her. Um, I'm glad that they helped her through that emotion, but I also think that a lot of them lied and didn't have the proper education and knowledge to work through all of that. Continuing on. I think if I hadn't been in this Florence Crentantine home, it would have been, it would have been entirely different. My parents never talked about emotional issues. The group counseling enabled me at a very young age to sort of talk to myself and to my, ask myself the necessary questions to be able to make the decision, will I be able to live with this? I knew I could go totally off the deep end. Having too much, having to make such a decision, if I wasn't 100% sure that I could live with it, Pamela won. Many women established strong friendships during their stays, though most did not keep in touch after they left. You're going to laugh at this, but what I remember most about this home was that it was right next to a black church, and on Sunday mornings they sang, and I have never heard anything like that in my life. 
I was a singer. As a matter of fact, I met the father of my child in the course at the at University of Toledo. But a memory I have to this day is looking down from this building and seeing the church and the movement of the bodies and the singing. I also remember going on mass with all these other pregnant girls to the museum. I was embarrassed to be going out with the other girls because it was so obvious to other people what the situation was. I was probably mixed with more varieties of girls than I have ever grown, ever known growing up in a little town in Ohio where everybody was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. My mother, who was Catholic, was looked upon as someone different. So it was broadening to me with such a variety of girls. I remember two or three girls in particular. One got pregnant by her high school coach. Another worked in a motel, and I think she got pregnant by one of the men who was staying there. I thought that was pretty shameful. One was a wonderful girl, and we corresponded for years after. I don't believe she had any other children. I had to go back to Cleveland for a checkup, and she lived there. Her family had me stay at their home. They were lovely people. She was very bright, and she became a reporter for one of the Cleveland newspapers. Whoever got that child must have been very lucky. Carol won. Ooh, gross. Um, so first of all, the the racism, right? And then the trauma of the adoption and then the eugenics because the girl was nice to her. Um, so the, I hate to say it, the luck, quote unquote, of the adoptive parents. Um, it just shows that even birth parents are in the fog. Oh, sorry. I, I just needed to point that out. All right, continuing on. For most of the women I interviewed, however, especially those who were younger, being sent to a maternity home was a traumatic experience. They had been banished for, from the schools and homes. They were soon to give birth to a child, and rather than being surrounded by caring family members, they were living in institutions among strangers. Although many felt camaraderie with other young women who were there, they also felt that the environment was cold and demeaning, and that the disapproval of those who have looked after them was palpable. The philosophy and mission of maternity homes had changed considerably since the 1900s, when the maternity home movement began. The religious women who first ran homes saw themselves as sympathetic sisters who were there for women who had no place to turn. The home was a place of refuge and spiritual reform for women who had, in their eyes, been seduced and abandoned. Motherhood, they believed, would increase a woman's chance of living a good and proper life. During this time, babies were not separated from their mothers except under extreme circumstances, as when women cannot be, quote-unquote, cannot be helped or compelled to meet their obligation as parents, unquote. The hopes generally... The homes, sorry, generally encouraged bonding through breastfeeding and they helped the women find employment, usually as domestic servants, which would enable them to both care for their children and to work. Well, into the early 1940s, some homes still encouraged, if not required, the mother to breastfeed her baby to ensure that a bond developed between mother and child. By the end of World War II, a sea change had occurred in the mission and philosophy of the homes. Maternity homes of the 1950s and 1960s were to a great extent a place to sequester pregnant girls until they could give birth and surrender their child for adoption. If a young woman was unsure of or sorry, was unsure of or uninterested in relinquishment, the staff attempted to convince her that it was her bet that it was her best and perhaps only option. Though maternity homes were only a place a girl in trouble could turn for help outside of her family by the 1950s, they, burst, they best served her interest if her interest was in giving up her child for adoption at the end of her stay. The change in philosophy was highly contested among those who ran the homes and did not come about uniformly. To a great extent, the views at individual homes changed as the staff changed. Between the turn of the century and the 1940s, the women who had founded the homes were supplanted by professional social workers who reshaped the understanding of non-marital pregnancy. 
In the first two decades of the 20th century, social work evolved into a genuine profession, and those who helped professionalize the field were eager to differentiate themselves from charity workers and reformers, whom they saw as overly sentimental and old-fashioned. These profession professionals formulated what they considered to be a more rigorous approaches to social problems, rather than basing their practices on religious perspectives. As the professionals took positions at maternity homes and began to work alongside religious reformers, philosophical, philosophical clashes resulted. resulted sorry. Social workers claimed expertise. As trained professionals, they considered themselves better equipped to diagnose the problems associated with illegitimacy. While their religious predecessors had generally attributed out-of-wedlock pregnancy to social circumstances of the women's lives and to outside social forces, the new breed of social worker focused on the women themselves. Over many years, they posted a number of theories about why single women became pregnant, all of which were predicated on the problems inherent in the women themselves. In the early 1900s, most social workers argued that women who became pregnant out of wedlock were feeble-minded. Their pregnancy was proof of their feeble-mindedness. This made them seem especially dangerous to society because it was believed that these women were not only likely to be repeat offenders, but that they would produce offspring of low intelligence. These concerns were amplified by social reformers who were already proclaiming that the country was in the midst of moral decay and that the family was breaking down, as evidenced by lower birth rates among the quote-unquote better classes of people. They believed that unwed mothers were both the product of bad homes and the cause of broken homes. Of course they do. During this time, the concern over non-marital pregnancy was so great that many feeble-minded unwed mothers were either institutionalized or sterilized. That's a whole other thing that we could go into. If you guys are interested, please let me know. But yikes. Just yikes, right? Classifying all unwed mothers as feeble-minded, however, proved impossible. Social workers themselves had to acknowledge that many of the women who became pregnant were, quote, normally intelligent and relatively well-balanced young women, unquote. So a new category was identified, that of the delinquent. So we are going to go more into this with um, the psychology of adoption and coming home of self. I think that's what it's called um, by uh, Nancy Newton Very two different books that we'll be reading in the future. Um, this whole mindset of a delinquent versus all this other stuff, it's truly problematic, right? Anyway, this type of woman had a parallel in the male population, but where delinquency in the male was identified by criminal behavior, female delinquency was defined in sexual terms. So that is something that they do talk about when it comes to um, birth parents. You know, it's delinquency doesn't necessarily mean criminal, but it could. Sometimes it's interchangeable when it shouldn't be. Anyway, we can rant about stuff for days, I swear. Um, anyway, the young women who fell into this category were largely seen as those belonging to the working class. By the 1920s, many single women were working in factories, offices, and department stores. They enjoyed a degree of independence and opportunity to fraternize with men. Their sexual lives did not always conform to middle-class standards, and those cases were labeled, quote, sexually deviant, unquote. This behavior, incidentally, was soon to invade the ranks of the middle class. Despite the widespread characterizations of unwed mothers as either feeble-minded breeders or sex delinquents, letters and internal correspondence from Florence Crinton homes operating in the 1940s offer evidence to the contrary, and the person personnel at the homes were still gener generally supportive of and empathetic to the girls in their charge. 
A concrete example of such support was found in the application materials for the Kate Waller Barrett Scholarship, which was sponsored by the Crinton Homes in the early 1940s. These scholarship funds were described in materials printed by Florence Crinton Mission as being available to, quote, a girl who wishes to continue her education and enable her to care for her child, unquote. The application required support letters from the superintendent of the home, and if the application was successful, the agreement stipulated that the staff at the Critton home would assume responsibility for the care of the child, if necessary, while the mother attended school. One such applicant, while well, from a girl I will call B, was submitted by the superintendent of an Arizona maternity home. After the deadline had passed, the scholarship committee wrote back, to say that the home would have to resubmit the application the following year. The staff continued to write letters on behalf of the young woman, lent her money from the treasury to pay tuition, and pursued the matter until funds were secured. The application, with support letters, provides a vivid portrait both of the young woman and the staff's perception of her. B's application was accompanied by a letter from the principal of her high school that described her as graduating in the, quote, the upper bracket of her class, and rated by faculty as being outstanding, dependable, and trustworthy, and one of the most likely to succeed in her undertakings, unquote. The superintendent of the Critton home wrote, B has worked with our graduate nurse and has shown a liking and aptitude for the nursing profession. B is a girl with a very pleasing personality, nice even in disposition, soft-spoken and reserved of manner. She has always been des desirous of becoming a nurse, and we feel that with these mentioned qualities, that the fact that she takes telling nicely she will do well in this, will in this her chosen work. For the present, we are keeping B's baby boy, who is a dear little fellow, until other plans can be worked out for him. It gives us pleasure to recommend B for the scholarship, and we shall await your reply anxiously. Um, I think it's kind of nice that they take care of the baby for a little bit. Of course, you know, we know that the baby's going to end up in the adoption, um, being adopted, but... So, yeah, anyway, in 1940, sorry, in November of 1941, B received her scholarship and wrote the following letter of thanks. Dear Mrs., since this is the Thanksgiving season, I thought it would be very appropriate for me to write a letter and tell you what a great part your help has been in all the things I have given. I have to give this year. Your scholarship of $50 has enabled me to stay here at St. Mary's and continue uh, my training where otherwise I don't see how I could possibly have stayed. My work here is very interesting. Such good work. I've made very good grades and I am a Catholic. The setting here is very much to my liking. We have a very lovely hospital two miles out of the city. Sister, our directress of nurses, has been very kind to me and shows a great deal of interest in me and my little baby boy. My baby is in Phoenix now, and once in a while I get to see him. He's growing so fast, and I am so proud of him. I guess I'm just a little awed by him, and of course there isn't anything I wouldn't do to enable him to have every advantage I think he deserves. Mrs. of the Florence Critton home in Phoenix has been a great factor in helping me get back on my feet again. She so kind and thoughtful. You can't imagine how wonderful I was treated at the home. Mrs. was always there to offer comfort or advice whenever it was needed. Surely no other person could do work quite so wonderfully as she. Then after I left there, the scholarship fund helped me into St. Mary's, and here I am, trying earnestly to get back on my feet and more so I can support my little baby boy and prove myself worthy of all the trust that has been placed in me. Once more, I wish to express my thanks to you and all you've done for me, and believe me, a day never goes by that I do not say a little prayer of thanks for such wonderful friends as you. 
Sincerely, B. Another young woman from Youngston, Ohio, upon learning that she has received a scholarship, writes, I wish to thank you for helping me fulfill my life ambition to become a nurse. This will also mean I can keep my baby. Otherwise, my family didn't want me to. Now, because of what you have done to help, they have agreed to help her, to keep her for me until it's possible for me to take her. All right, pausing there. So, she's about to talk about the support, right? But, now this is, granted, the 1940s. So, this is before the big baby boom. Um, Adoption is still happening, but not to the same extent. Here's the thing. That little amount of support, and as we stated earlier, $50 then was approximately $1,200 now, right? In Or what was in 1995. Now it would be probably like 1800 if not a little bit more with the inflation. That little amount of money can help keep a family together. The support that sh- they have, right, with the home, and I'm not saying the home is the best place, but support of the home with people that encourage her and help her, you know, if they had family, these are things that are happening or could happen today with um, helping with, you know, biological mothers who, who need that support and those resources can keep more families together. And that is what we're all about. So I love the fact that they put that in there while at the same time expressing that there is this big need. All right, continuing on. The kind of support and compassion demonstrated by maternity home staff in these letters seems to have all but evaporated in the years after World War II. The ongoing struggles between those who align themselves with the sentiments of maternity home founders and those who adopted newer professional strategies come to a symbolic, if not an actual end, in 1947, when the National Florence Clinton Mission abandoned its policy of keeping mother and child together. And this is where the problem is. As the uh, philosoph- philosophical differences narrowed in the 1940s and social workers uh, coalesced toward agreement on the best course of action for unwed mothers and their babies, efforts to identify the cause of out-of-wedlock pregnancy took a new turn. With a drastic rise in premarital pregnancies after the war, and as greater numbers of middle-class women became pregnant, it became increasingly implausible to label all these women as either feeble-minded or sexual delinquents. Social workers noted that many of these new unmarried mothers were middle-class girls from good families. A Crinton social worker wrote that these girls that are... The sizable numbers further confound us by rendering our former stereotypes less tenable. Immigration, low mentality, and hypersexuality can no longer be comfortably applied when the phenomenon has invaded our own social class. When the unwed mother can be must be classified to include the nice girl next door, the physicians or pastor's daughters. Okay, so here's the thing. As they stated, they look down upon people who were not like them, who were not of the same socioeconomic class, um, who didn't look like them, who don't have the same religion. This still happens today, not to the same extent, but still happens, right? So now with the turn of, you know, right after World War II, when all this was happening, it was kind of like a shock, right? And they had to re- define things to include these people while still demonizing them see what i'm saying it's a it's still a problem but they were kind of socially a little bit more aware that you know oh hey we have to fix things but we don't really have to fix things so anyway social workers turned to the growing field of psychiatry for their answer and as early as the 1940s began to classify middle-class girls who became pregnant as neurotic. The unwed mother was a neurotic woman who had a subconscious desire to become pregnant. This theory dominated much of the diagnosis and treatment of unwed mothers in the decades that followed the war. Those social workers had been quick to condemn working girls as sex deviants, 
This new explanation was more appealing in explaining middle-class pregnancy because it downplayed the issue of sexual drive. By identifying the young woman's goal as pregnancy rather than sex, the diagnosis of deviance could be bypassed. Though young women's peers, family, and community may still have attributed her pregnancy to loose morals or an overactive sex life, professionals determined that the problem was in her mind. Ugh, sorry. It's, like, so refreshing to read some of this, you know. Um, but here's the thing. You know, my parents grew up during this time. And I should totally ask them about um, what you know, like their education experience was, by the way, my mom is a social worker. Um, and she did work in foster care in the like late eighties, early nineties, um, in New York city. And, you know, she's helped teens and stuff. So it's, it's not so much that this doesn't happen. And obviously there's a lot of puberty happening, but there's a lot of lack of sex education too. And, Looking on 2023 and our political fight on sex education and, like, helping people and the rights of teen pregnancies and all of this again, it's sad because while some do absolutely get the support now, thank God, we're kind of turning back to that time and it's such a huge problem, right? So... We need to not just look at the statistics. We need to look at the education. We need to look at the science. We need to do better. We need to have these social conversations. But also, beyond that, we need to change the laws. And it's not a red versus blue issue. It is both. Both are the problem. Both it affects everyone, right? It's My point is, it's not one political issue. It's not for one... How am I trying to say this? It's not just a Democratic issue or a Republican issue, right? We, we obviously know that certain um, political groups push certain things more, which are a problem, I agree. But socially and you know, legally, it is a both. We need both to get on board. And we're going to be covering this. There are laws that are beginning to be pushed by both parties that can get on board. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not siding with any one side. I mean, I am personally, but on this page, it's it's not about like, oh, you know, you're one side or the other we're talking about the overall we need everyone to help us anyway I'm sorry guys I just went on a huge rant anyway one of the outcomes of this new profession diagnose professional diagnosis was the justification of the separation of mother and child a neurotic woman was seen as unfit to be a mother given the stigma of illegitimacy in the 1950s and 1960s. Many middle-class parents were quick to agree that the solution to the problem was relinquishment and adoption. Following this course, their daughter would be given a second chance. Her pregnancy would effectively be erased from her history, and she would expect to go back to a normal life, as if it had never happened. Without her child, she would be able to marry a decent man and have other children. She would not have to live with her mistake. Adoption also came to be an understanding as being in the best interest of the child, rather than growing up with the stigma of illegitimacy. And an unfit, neurotic mother, the child would be raised by a stable, well-adjusted married couple. <sighs> so many lies! I'm sorry. But this is exactly how... It's seen, even in today's world, not so much the illegitimacy, but the um, the unfit, the, for, you know, the abuser. I'm not saying bio moms are abusers, but that's often what we hear. Um, but they're unfit. They can't take care of the kid. They don't want the kid. And then on the other side, they're, they're stable. They're well-adjusted. They have the money. 
they're married, they're Catholic or Christian or whatever. And yet it's usually vice versa that other than the money portion, right? But on the harm and we are wanted like reading through these stories you know alone shows that the baby is wanted the baby is always wanted you know 99 percent of birth moms admit that they want a parent only and i would say it's less than one percent but about one percent admit that they didn't actually want to raise their child um and even then i don't know how much i trust them um but I will give it to them that less than 1%, right? So, yeah, it's, it's quite sad. Anyway, let's continue on. And though some maternity home workers were still empathetic to young women who did not want to surrender their baby for adoption, in the post-war years, this breed of social worker was rapidly becoming extinct. Internal struggles at the maternity homes continued even into the 1950s and are uh, evident in correspondence between the leadership of the Florence Clinton Association of America and the newly hired staff of an individual homes. In a letter dated December 23, 1952, Robert Barrett, the chairman of the Florence Clinton Mission, expresses his concern over a move to shorten the minimum length of a girl's stay in the maternity home postpartum. The purpose of a mother's and child's returning to the home after birth was, Barrett asserts, to give mother time to be with her baby before making a final decision to surrender. Oh, boy. So, as we've heard from previous stories, being with the baby didn't actually happen. Um, It should have happened, but it didn't happen, which is a problem, you know, other than the ones that, like, had the scholarships. So, yeah. Anyway. Personally, I feel very bad that a girl in our homes should not be given every opportunity to help keep her baby if she wants. Often a girl who has made up her mind to give up her baby feels different after the baby comes and her mother's instinct is aroused. And he's correct on that. Not to give her the chance seems cruel and unnatural proceeding. I am not sure, but I feel it would be better for the girl if she tries to take her baby and fails and has to give it up later. Okay, the fact that (laughs) the CEO... The CEO of Florence Kern Mission can admit to this back in 1952, right? So this is, we're talking 70 years ago, and this was not happening. That is sad. That is really sad. Now, granted, the anti-adoption movement started in the 1940s, which is the same time that Georgia Tan um, was doing this whole unwed mothers by the way she also ran a home and down in Tennessee we'll, we will be talking more about her um and that's why the adoption laws changed so thank you a known human trafficker named Georgia Tan um during the same time so yeah but the fact that this was happening and they didn't fix it is an issue continuing on The new policies were shaped by the experts, primarily psychiatrists, social workers, and medical professionals, and promoted by social organizations that had the power and means to disseminate the ideas. The women whose babies were being placed for adoption were not in any position to influence the policies made on their behalf. Shame is a very effective way to silence individuals, and those who are less socially or economically powerful are rarely in a position to influence the decisions that affect them. The message was, this is the good thing for you to do for your baby. It would be really irresponsible to keep it. I was hooked up with a nice Jewish adoption agency in New York. It's probably the same one my mom worked at. <laughs> just saying. Well, it, was, it wasn't just adoption. It was foster care. But, yeah. <sighs> so it was. Quote, Your baby could have the best. How would you dare to cheat your baby of this good life? Unquote. Ugh, I hate these. I really hate these. I'm sorry, guys. I'm ranting. I am ranting today. (laughs) 
anyway, I know a little about the good life because I now have contact with my birth son. It's stupid to tell young people that. Do they know what the baby's going to going to have is good? I mean, how can you say that? Yeah, so it's not a good life. It's a different life, and it's a life full of trauma. Yeah, I said it. I said it. All right, continuing on. I'm a psychologist now. Could I interview somebody and tell you what kind of parent they're going to be? But that was the spiel. I'd say I was brainwashed. It's interesting when they talk about the cults and people feeling dependent on leaders and abusive relationships. I mean, I think this had some of the same qualities. It wasn't like lecturing. It was a culture. It was a culture where you were desperate. You were ashamed and desperate. You needed these people, and the culture was that you gave up your baby to a life that was better than you. You could give it. I feel like, what was wrong with me? I mean, I could have done it. I think I was n- numb or something. How, uh, sorry, you know how when you're sick sometimes you feel like all your energy is going toward healing your body and you don't have the energy for anything else? I think all of my energy was going toward the baby. And keeping my body okay. I don't know. I must have been crazier than I thought. I really believe that it would hurt my baby to be with me. They somehow convinced me that all the bullshit of a fancy house and degrees. I have a doctorate myself and I think it's all bullshit. I don't think it makes me a good mother. I think it makes a good father. I don't think it makes a good father. I don't think it makes a good person. It's stupid. But somehow or other, in that vulnerable position, being pregnant and being dependent, somehow it all came together. I just let that baby go. It feels like a real violation to me. I was so beaten down that I believed, or maybe our fear of I made myself believe, that I was doing a good thing for this kid. I think the shame is I can't correct it, and I really just did the wrong thing really the wrong thing we have changed our idea of mothering now you're supposed to have enough money to have two homes and four cars and send your kids to graduate school where in the world does this come from i mean i see people in therapy who want to be stay-at-home parents when they grew up when they grow up because both of their highly educated parents have not been around i think the whole idea was that there's only one way for children to be raised that we nice white Americans know the way, and it's married. It is a joke, because 50% of these idiots who are saying that are divorced now. Judith won. Okay, love the fact that she's talking about this. Um, she even calls them out, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's this whole, like, fantasy of what it's going to be like, and it's not. And, you know, I kind of feel that, like, my parents both worked um my mom did go to school at one point I'm you know I had a nanny and don't get me wrong my nanny was wonderful and I had a pretty decent childhood right not saying that there wasn't trauma involved because of my adoption there absolutely was but I as a parent now like to work from home because I want to give my son something that I didn't have and that's huge, you know. So it's always, it's always, you know, the want to give your future children what you didn't have or what you felt like you lacked out on. And that's not a bad thing necessarily, but it's not always better. In the theory, it was not the social worker, but the mother who made the ultimate decision whether to parent or relinquish. A Florence Crittenden brochure from 1952 reads, quote, The mother is under no compulsion either to leave her baby with us or to take him with her. There is no priority for either, unquote. But it also states that, blank, or, quote, Although the mother should perhaps make the choice, not always is she well qualified to make this last decision, unquote. And through maternity homes were thought to be safe havens and, quote, the goal of all these efforts combined is to induct into society a mother and child, each well started on the road to a successful living, unquote. In reality, this goal was often not fully realized. 
So really, um, you know, majority of the time, right? So there's like 1% that we heard, bless them, the two stories with the scholarships. That didn't happen. They didn't get a choice. You know, as we've heard before, the mothers who did, you know, want to fight for their babies um, had to pay up and they couldn't. So they made it impossible for it to happen, right? It was forced. Anyway, rather than young women being given a realistic picture of their responsibilities and costs of raising a child and allowing them to weigh the information against the resources available to them so they could participate in making an informed decision, they were rendered powerless. And though it might be easy to empathize with social workers' efforts to try to persuade a young woman a few resources to be realistic about raising a baby, especially if they lacked family support and did not understand the difficulty and sacrifice involved in raising a child as a single parent. The pervasive techniques were often quite forceful. The degree of pressure put on the woman to surrender sometimes crossed the line from persuasion to outright coercion. Many of the young, many of the women I interviewed recalled high pressure campaigns waged by the maternity home staff, as we've already read. Okay. I remember the woman at the adoption agency, a very pleasant woman, smiling, always smiling, using comforting tones. She had dark hair. She sat there and said that I had nothing to offer a baby. I had no education. I had no job. I had no money. Oh God, they really know how to work you. Talk about no support. It was how far we can beat you down while we're smiling. And this still happens today. Isn't it lovely? Sorry. The social worker was telling me, no man is going to want to marry you. No man is going to want to another man's baby. She proceeded to tell me that the adoptive parents they would find for the baby would be college educated, degreed. They would be much older. They would have their own home, have high incomes. They would be able to give the baby everything that I could not. They told me I was unfit because I wasn't married. I didn't have this. I didn't have that. Well, it turns out her adoptive parents were just a couple of years older and neither one had a college education. Nothing against them. But the adoption agency lied to me. They also divorced when she was 14. I'm with the same man for 38 years. Financially, her adoptive parents were better off than we were. But other than that, it wasn't anything like what the agency promised. Christine. Another thing that they did and still do today is they gave tax incentives to adoptive parents. You know, you can write it off. You get money from the company you worked for. That's more recent, but um, a lot of companies give anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 if you're trying to have a baby. Um, That could be through IVF or surrogacy or adoption. Yeah, I said it. Um, there's, you know, there, they talk about fundraising. You can have bake sales and you can make a GoFundMe and you can do advertising like in newspapers or now on TikTok or YouTube or Facebook, um, which is all illegal, by the way. It's very, very illegal, but you know, they don't care. Anyway, yeah, the, the agencies lie. The argument that the others would be better parents presumed, of course, that the mother's own economic standing would not improve anytime soon, if ever through further education, job or career training, marriage or family support. It also presumed that the adopting couple's status would not deteriorate through divorce or job loss. Essentially, the gap of In economic and marital status between the mother and the adoptive family was seen as fixed, whereas only a decade earlier, the mother's circumstances had been viewed as temporary and improvable, and steps were taken to help help her become self-reliant. In the post-war years, most of the homes aimed simply to ensure that the physical needs of the women were met until they could give birth and relinquish the baby, and despite the momentous life change that they were about to go through, Most were sent to the hospital knowing nothing about childbirth. Issue, right? Nor were they counseled about the impending separation. 
Most were completely unprepared for the emotions that would follow their transition from pregnant girls to mothers. <sighs> None of these girls in the home have given birth, so they're all in their little rosy illusions about everything. They might talk about their parents or their school or their boyfriends or whatever, but they don't know what's coming. They have no clue what's coming. So other than giving each other comfort, and we're not the only ones in the world who are pregnant and not married, which was a good thing, there wasn't any discussion about the things we should have should have been talking about. Just mostly happy little wasting time kind of stuff. And the most profound thing I remember is the nun at St. Andre's telling me that it was God's will. It was God's will. Ugh, I hate the I hate the religious aspect. I'm sorry. We were fulfilling the needs and hearts of women who couldn't have children. Yeah, so it's God's will so that they don't have children. Like, what the f- I, I'm sorry, guys. Like, it's gross. And therefore, God chose us to bear those children for these women who couldn't have any. I was so sus- susceptible to this thinking. I must accept God's will. I could have more children, you see. So therefore, what's one child to be given away? I could see this child in heaven, Lynn. Yeah, so this still happens today where, like, super religious people are like, it's God's will for you to have been adopted. Uh, No, God would have wanted us to be with our bio parents. Like, shut up. I said it. Shut up. Okay, sorry, guys. Of course, the pregnant women who went into hiding were not of one mind, nor were the staff of the institutions they entered. A few women reported that they were counseled in a respectful manner and came to their own decision, but the majority of the women I interviewed did not make a decision to surrender. Many women, even those in their 20s, followed the only path that was available to them, the only prescribed by society, social workers, and parents. After all, they had been through, and all they had put their parents through, and they felt that more than anything, they needed to regain their family's acceptance. Because, you know, dishonor on your family. Dishonor on your cow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's all. That's, I always think, like, Mulan in that manner. Um, yes, I am a big Disney fan. And there's a reason. Well, okay. Ironically, I'm a huge Disney fan for other reasons. But Walt Disney was an adoptive parent, which is why a lot of adoption content comes up. Um, I, I will talk about that. <laughs> I I will definitely talk about that one day. All right, anyway. Where was I? Uh, Some women decidedly did not want to surrender, but were unable to devise a plan that would allow them to care for their baby without some temporary assistance. Many of the women who wanted to parent could have been, would have been capable of doing so with a modest amount of support. The kind offered to be only a decade or so earlier. But by mid-1960s, professionals were no longer offering this kind of support, and more than 80% of those who entered maternity homes surrendered. In my mind, all I knew was that if I was ever going to get home and be back in my family's good graces, I had to get this finished. I think we were too young to really realize that this child was going to be a little person until the day came and it was a little person that always makes me cry they were very unfeeling about it i really felt we were being punished and they did a pretty good job of it mary won whether the women were resistant or compliant they the supposed transformation the wiping away of the past in preparation for a stable marriage and legitimate childbearing was often not successful Rather than leaving the system with a clean slate free of their past, many were burdened with the feelings of low self-esteem and unworthiness and laden with secrets, shame, loss, and grief. I've battled depression ever since that time. I kind of overcome it. I'm successful, and but I think of my life as before and after, sort of like BC and AD. I think of who I was and who I am. Dealing with the emotion and pain of it, dealing with the loneliness, I've always felt grief is exhausting, and I'm grieved. I think that sorrow and sadness come about not just from the act of surrender, but also from the lies. Lynn, the practice of telling young women that they would have been 
that they would be able to give birth, surrender their children, and move on as it never happened caused many irreparable harm. Rather than being prepared during this residency, either for mothering or for the feelings that would follow relinquishment, the women were made to feel like something was wrong with them for loving and mourning the loss of their child. Not only did this practice not acknowledge their motherhood, it did not respect their dignity. Throughout my pregnancy, I always thought that I could put this behind me. I thought, I'm growing a baby for a family that could not have children. They will be the best parents in the world. They will love him and take care of him. And I always thought my purpose of getting pregnant was to give a child to a family that could not have one. I thought, I'm going to put it behind me like it didn't happen. Like I had a lobotomy and I could cut off the memory. That didn't happen. I had mem moments when I wanted to cancel this interview because I'm reliving this. Why do I want to bring this up? Fresh in my mind, I thought, okay, I'm going to do my two, three hours, and then I'm going to push it back again and go ahead. But I'm lying to myself now, just like I lied to myself then. I didn't deal with my pregnancy. I never dealt with the fact that I was growing a baby that I would have to relinquish. Cheryl. All right, so that is the end of... Um, part one of chapter six, the main portion, we are going to be hearing Karen's story tomorrow. And then next week we'll be back on schedule. Finally, um, the chaos in my house has been resolved for the most part. We'll be hearing Pam's story next week. Um, and a couple more weeks, May, right? Um, we'll be ending the book through May. And then we're going to be talking about the psychology of adoption. So stay tuned. Um, if you guys have anything you guys want to talk about, any questions, any topics, go ahead and comment. You can reach out to me on TikTok, uh, whichever is fine. I'll see you guys soon.